Good morning to you all again uh, this morning on what is a, a normal Sunday morning. The last couple of weeks have, I've been uh, sort of doing these messages on Facebook. It's been a, a Palm Sunday or a Good Friday or an Easter Sunday. But today is just a normal Sunday. It feels anything but a normal Sunday, but um, it's not one of the, the special ones. And so in an attempt uh, to get us back to a little bit of normality in the, the Bethel bush. I'm going to be um, sharing this morning on what I would have been sharing on from the Bible if this was a normal Sunday and if we were all together in church uh, in Clidach. If you're a, a member or, uh, or someone who comes to the, the Bethel bush regularly, you would know that we've been, uh, for the last two years really, working our way through on a Sunday morning the, the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and we're up to chapter 10. And so I thought we would continue looking at that uh, this morning. We've reached the, the point in Mark's Gospel where we're right at the beginning of the Easter story, funnily enough. So we'll be going back in time about two or three weeks uh, this morning to the beginning of the Easter story. Uh, and the passage and the verses that I want to talk about this morning are um, a story that happens when Jesus and his disciples are making their way up to Jerusalem. Uh, they're making their way to Jerusalem, the, the city. Uh, for Passover, for the Feast of Passover. Um, and as we know now, because we've gone through Easter and we've read the end of the book, as Jesus is in Jerusalem, he is arrested and then he is tried and then he is crucified. So we're going back a little bit in time this morning, two or three weeks, to the journey that Jesus and his disciples make up to Jerusalem for Passover and for what we know today as Easter. I'm going to read just a few verses this morning from Mark chapter 10 uh, and start in at verse 35 and just reading three or four verses together. Mark 10 and verse 35 says this, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand, and the other on your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask, for are you able to drink the cup that I drink, and be baptised with the baptism that I am baptised with? Mark 10, verse 35 to verse 38. It's a conversation that Jesus has as he is on his way to Jerusalem with two of his most trusted disciples, and perhaps even more than that, two of his most trusted friends. You know, as you read through the gospel stories, that out of the, the 12 disciples, there seems to have been this inner group, a more trusted group of three particular disciples, Peter and James and John. And they are with Jesus at times when the other of the 12 are not. So they are with Jesus when he is on the Mount of Transfiguration. They are with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. They seem to be this little inner group of disciples in amongst the twelve. And two of them are talking with Jesus on this journey up to Jerusalem, James and John. Now we know quite a lot about James and John. We know that they are brothers. We know that they are fishermen. And we know that of all the disciples, they are committed and they are loyal to a fault to Jesus, they are master and they are teacher. Now, when it seems from reading the, the passage that we have this morning, that they are not just loyal and not just uh, committed, but they are ambitious too. And they have a plan for what they hope to be in the future. Now, there's nothing wrong with that at all. You know, these two brothers have been with Jesus these last couple of years. They realise that he is someone wonderful and that he is someone special, and they realise that he has a future and a destiny, and they have their eyes on being someone special in his wonderful kingdom. They weren't just interested in today or tomorrow, but they were interested in the future, and they had a plan. They wanted to be something and be somewhere in a future kingdom with Jesus. It's a bit like being perhaps in an interview. I don't know if you've ever been in an interview when someone has asked you, where do you see yourself in five years time or in 10 years time? Now, I would be terrible at that. I've never been asked that question in an interview, but I would, be, I would give a terrible answer 
if I were ever to ask that question because I'm not that type of person. I'm not the, the type of person who has much of a plan of what to do five or ten years in the future. But some people I know really do. They are ambitious and they are committed and they know where they want to be in five or ten years' time. And they have a plan of how to get there. And it seems to me that James and John, as we've read this little conversation that they have with Jesus, are that type of people. They're ambitious. They know where they want to be. And they have a plan on how to get there. They have their eyes on a, a prize in the future and a goal in the future. And they have plans of how to get there. James and John were that type of people. They realised that Jesus was coming into his kingdom. And they realised and they could feel that something special was about to happen as they journeyed into Jerusalem and they wanted to be a part of it and they didn't want to just be a little part of it they wanted to be a great part of it and a special part of it they wanted to be someone in the kingdom that Jesus would bring to and so on this journey and I suppose away from the the other disciples they find a, a quiet spot or a quiet corner they take Jesus to one side and they say Lord will you do something for us and he asked them, well, what do you want me to do for you? We want a position, they said, in your kingdom. When you come into your kingdom, then we want a position there with you. And not just any position, but a great position. And a position of strength and a position of honour. We want a seat with you, says James and John, at the top table. And we want a top role and a top job. We want to sit one on your right hand. And one on your left. Now I suppose they would argue between the two of them who would go on the right or on the left. But these brothers wanted or had an ambition to be something great in the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of Jesus. And what Jesus says to them, as, as we've read it this morning, I don't think it's a, a rebuke. And he doesn't slap them down. He doesn't say to them, how dare you? Ask this great thing of me. And so the, the answer that Jesus gives to them isn't a rebuke, I don't feel, but more of a, an observation and a, a genuine question that is going to think, make them think and make them look at themselves. He says to James and John, as they've asked for this great position, one it is right and one it is, is left, you don't know what you're asking, says Jesus. You haven't really thought this through. And then he, he gives them a challenge and gives them a question. Can you, can you drink the cup that I drink? Can you be baptised with the baptism that I'm about to be baptised with? In other words, Jesus is saying to them, look, are you willing to do what I'm willing to do? And perhaps more than that this morning, are you able to do what I am able to do. You see, it's, it's very clear to me in this um, reaction that Jesus gives and this question that he asks. It's very clear that these two disciples, for all their loyalty and for all their commitment to Jesus, they still hadn't really grasped who he was and what he had come to do and the future of the kingdom of Christ was very different in the eyes of James and John to what it was in the eyes of Jesus. These two men, for all their loyalty and, and for all their commitment and for all their ambition, still hadn't really grasped who Jesus was and what he had come to do. They still had this idea in their head that Jesus had come to reign and to rule. And to set up an earthly kingdom that would begin perhaps in Jerusalem where he would have might, where he would have power and where he would be recognised as the king of the nation, as the king of the Jews. They hadn't grasped what Jesus had come to do. Jesus hadn't come to be an earthly king. He wasn't going to Jerusalem to reign and to rule. He wasn't going to Jerusalem to sit on a throne. He wasn't going to Jerusalem to be a king. He was going to Jerusalem to be a sacrifice. He was going to Jerusalem to suffer 
and to die for the sins of the world. And James and John, for all their qualities and for all their attributes, which were many, for all their loyalty to Jesus, for all their commitment to him, for all their ambition, they couldn't do what he would do. They couldn't become a sacrifice. They couldn't suffer and die for the sins of the world. For all that they were, they couldn't do that. They couldn't suffer and die for the sins of the world for one very good reason, because they were sinners themselves, and they needed someone who would suffer for them. They were sinners themselves, and so they couldn't be a sacrifice for other people because they needed a sacrifice for themselves. Now, if, I, if we could be a bit more personal this morning, James and John, for all that they could do, they couldn't be of any help to you and to me. You know, they could suffer in Jerusalem. They could die in Jerusalem. But their suffering would have no impact on me, no meaning for me. Their death would have no impact and no meaning for me. They were unable to do what Jesus could do for me. You know, it needed someone who was greater than James and John. It needed someone who had no sins of their own, who had no wrongdoing of their own, someone who was perfect and pure and sinless. And James and John were great, but James and John were not that. You know, this was a situation where Jesus and only Jesus would do. It was a time in the life of these two men, it was a time in the lives of the disciples when even they, even James and John, would have to take a back seat and watch as Jesus did what only Jesus could do. For all their attributes, for all that they could do, they couldn't do that. Now, as we look at, um, come up to date and as we look at our situation in our own country and the things that we are going through as a nation at the moment, you now it's bringing out um, a wonderful side to so many people around us. You know, as, as we watch the news, it's difficult not to be inspired and difficult perhaps not to, to watch it with a, a tear in our eye and a lump in our throat as we realise the wonderful things that men and women are doing in our day and age. And people are going out of their way to show love for their neighbours, to show love for the weak, and for the, the vulnerable, they are doing the most wonderful things. You know, and this week, as we've seen on our TV screens, we have older people who are walking around their gardens and raising millions and millions of pounds for our NHS. We have younger people who are risking so much to look after and care for those who are sick. You know, and it's inspiring. And it has been a wonderful thing to see, and this nation of ours, you know, and it's been so fragmented, hasn't it, over the last couple of months, the last couple of years, it's been so divided, had so many problems over these last couple of months, and last couple of years, but now it has come together in such a wonderful way. It has shown the best side that it has. Men and women showing how great and wonderful and compassionate they can be. But there's still a limit in what we can do. There's still a limit in what we have. There is a time when effort and talent and expertise and energy and endeavour, even from the best of us, are just not enough. And even at this time, the same as James and John discovered all those years ago, there is still a time where we cannot meet needs for one another. There is still a time where there is a need of someone greater than us, greater than you and me, and greater than any of us, to come and to do things for us. There is still a need, even in our day and age, of a sacrifice. There is still a need of a saviour. There is still a need of someone to come and take away from me what I cannot get rid of myself, to do for me what I cannot do for myself. There is still a need of someone to come 
and take away the consequences of sin. Introduce me to a God who loves me and who cares for me. No, they, these are really big questions. Questions about the meaning of life itself and the value of life itself. And God, who is he? And what does he think of me? Does he care for me? Does he love me? And do I have a future in him? You know, and if you were looking for the answers to those questions this morning, and if you were looking for someone to come and take away the consequences of your sin and introduce you to a God who do, does love and who does care for you, if you were looking for someone to do that, then don't look at me. Because try as I might, and whatever energy and talent and commitment I might have, I could never do that for you. Don't look to James and John, because however committed they are, and however loyal they are, and however ambitious they are, they could never do that for you. It's not the time to look to the government, because however committed they are, and however strong they are, and however committed they are, they could never do that for you. In fact, the Bible says, in the book of Hebrews, it would tell us to look towards Jesus, to fix our eyes upon him. You see, there are situations. There were 2,000 years ago, and there are today. There are situations when Jesus and he alone will do. And here is one of them. As we look for someone to take away the consequences of sin and to be our saviour. You know, there is a verse of a, a very old hymn that says, There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the door of heaven and let me in. There is a time for action. Of course there is. There is a time for energy and a time for enterprise. But there is also a time to look to Jesus as he does what only he can do.